My name is Jonathan Sutton, and today I'll be talking about classroom interior design for schools K through 12 with a high ratio of low-income students in Rochester, New York. I'm a fourth year interior design student at RIT with an immersion in economics. I am from Rochester and I plan to continue my studies uh, in graduate school at RIT while studying architecture. My capstone committee consists of Mary Golden, uh, who you've met, Robin Hadfield, an NCIDQ certified interior designer from Rochester, and Richard Getzloff, an NCIDQ certified interior designer, and also the president of Getzloff Design Group. The overview of this presentation today is the thesis question, the literature review, the research agenda, the creative agenda, and finally the summary and conclusion. This thesis investigates whether an innovative, flexible, and cost-effective design uh, can promote active learning in schools with a high ratio of low-income students. Specifically, can interior design help in any way in meeting the challenges of low-income communities in educating their children? The 2020 poverty guidelines for a family of four uh, was an income of $26,200. African Americans, African Americans living in Rochester had a 40% poverty rate, while the national average was 27. Hispanics living in Rochester had a 44% poverty rate, while the national, national average is 23%. Extreme poverty for a family of four was $11,925 income. 16% of Rochester's population lives in extreme poverty. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, one in five children under the age of 18 in the United States lives in poverty. 30% of children living in poverty do not finish high school. And according to the National Center for Education Statistics, only 16% of low-income students, uh, college students, graduate. Poverty reduces a child's readiness for school because it leads to poor physical health and motor skills diminishes a child's ability to concentrate and remember information and reduces attentiveness, curiosity, and motivation. In the end, poverty undermines a child's ability to learn in the classroom. Next is the literature review. So this literature review focused on classroom design and different features that affect student performance and achievement. Uh, this review found that most studies focused on lighting, acoustics, temperature, air quality, and color and the effects they had on students. One study found that inadequate lighting, noise, low air quality, and deficient heating in the classrooms are significantly related to worse student achievement. Furthermore, over half of US schools have inadequate structural facilities and students of color and lower income students are more likely to attend schools with inadequate facilities. One study focused on the background noise level of classrooms and how they affect student learning. The study, took place, the study took place in 11 elementary schools in Nebraska, most of which do it, did not meet the ANSI standard of a maximum level of background noise of 35 decibels. The study found that there's a negative correlation between background noise level and reading comprehension test scores for both low-income and non-low-income students. A lighting study compared the effects that fluorescent lights and LEDs had on student engagement in the classroom found that LEDs increase engagement while fluorescent lights have negative uh, qualities. This is because fluorescent lights require a ballast, which can cause them to oscillate or slightly flicker. Now, there are ballasts out there that can reduce this oscillation, but children with learning disabilities and developmental disorders still notice this flickering, which is very distracting to them. LEDs don't oscillate, and they can be retrofitted into fluorescent ballasts, and that which reduces their initial cost. Moreover, LEDs are energy efficient so they can save school money in schools over time. However, most schools in the United States have already started switching to LEDs because of this very, very same factor. Next is the research agenda and investigations. My research agenda has three approaches. The first being a survey for teachers at School 33, a school with a high ratio of low-income students. The survey was meant to determine the state of learning environments in Rochester to see what classrooms might benefit from. The second approach was research into East High and its educational partnership with the University of Rochester. East was a struggling school until 2014 when, the New, York, when New York State allowed U of R to take over East from the Rochester City School District. Seven years later, the school is doing much better. The final approach is a summary of interviews and design conversations with Christine Vargas. 
president of Vargas Associates. Vargas Associates is the main classroom furniture supplier and design firm for the Rochester City School District. Survey results. Since this thesis focuses on schools with a high ratio of low income students, schools in districts with a 14% or higher child poverty rate was, were targeted. The Rochester City School District was the largest school district targeted by the survey. Uh, it has a 36% child poverty rate and has 65 schools in the K-12 range. School 33 was the only school to agree to take this survey. Uh, school 33 is a K-6 elementary school with 1,100 students, 48% Hispanic, 44% African American. It's the largest student body in the Rochester City School District with a 13.8 student to teacher ratio ratio. The survey focused on acoustics, artificial light and daylight, thermal comfort, classroom flexibility and improvement. Eight teachers from school 33 responded to the survey. When asked if noises could be heard from outside of the classroom, all teachers said that they could hear noises. 62% of them said that they could hear other students, teachers and classrooms, while the other 38% said that they could hear bathrooms, hallway noises, the music room, and the cafeteria from their classrooms. 75% of teachers said that these noises were very distracting to students, while the other 25% said it depended on their student's age and several other factors, or that the noises had little impact. When asked about artificial lighting, 50% of teachers said that they had fluorescent lights that were too bright and harsh, while 25% of teachers said that they had poor lighting and utilized their own lights and daylight. Only 12% of teachers said that they have their lighting, that the lighting situation was adequate. When asked about access and the effects of daylight, 50% of teachers said that students like daylight, while 30% of teachers stated that classrooms have windows, but offices used for teaching do not. And then the final 13% of teachers said that they had very small windows. Moving on to, all right, when teachers were asked about the temperature of the classroom, the answers varied from too hot or too cold or it depended on the season. Only 37% of teachers said that it was comfortable or good. However, 100% of teachers said that if it was too hot or too cold, children did not work as well because they were distracted. So in heat, uh, they often became sluggish and were kind of tired. And then in the cold, they fidgeted, especially if they kept their coats on and kind of moved in place. Finally, when asked about classroom flexibility, 63% of teachers responded with not enough space, while others said it was extremely flexible or varied, or was adequate. The final question in the survey asked, what could be improved in the classroom? Most of the answers were along similar topics brought up in the survey, such as better lighting or a bigger classroom with better ventilation. But some teachers answered with more storage or more comfortable seating itself. Moving on to the East High investigation. So East High, it's run by, it's currently run by the University of Rochester as an educational partnership organization. Uh, under New York State Law 211E, it allows an outside organization to run a struggling school or force the school district to shut down that school. Back in 2014, when it was really bad, East High was uh, told that there are they going to shut down or another school is going to come in. And so the University of Rochester came in. U of R implemented a welcoming school culture, personal contact with parents and families, programs and systems to address and improve attendance, as well as record keeping and logistics. East struggled because of chronic absenteeism, which is missing 10% or more of a school year. Uh, Chronic absenteeism increases the chances of repeating a year of high school or dropping out of high school. And the earlier a student uh, becomes chronically absent, they're even more likely to repeat a year or drop out because it forms bad habits and they'll consistently miss school year after year. Uh, chronic absence can also be a symptom of poverty. And common factors that lead to chronic absence are avoiding unsafe conditions, bullies, harassment, embarrassment, feeling uh, disconnected from the community or just trying to avoid poor facility conditions. After five years, the suspension rate uh, at East High dropped by 80%. Uh, and then their attendance increased from 77% in grades seven through 12 to 90% in grades six through eight, as well as 82% in grades nine through 12. 
the idea of what East High said, uh, the fact, uh, the conclusion of the investigation is that classroom design is not the only factor that affects students in the classroom because a school community is just as important as the physical environment, meaning the, uh, the environment at East High uh, was meant to be more of a more welcoming and open environment to encourage students to actually stay in school. However, the physical environment does affect um, students in the classroom, but uh, the psychological environment and overall community is just as important. Next is the interview with Christine Vargas. So a quick summary is, Christine is the president of Vargas Associates and Vargas Associates is the main classroom furniture supplier and designer for the Rochester City School District. Uh, what we mainly talked about was classroom furniture, so in particular, viability, durability, and mobility of furniture, meaning uh, furniture has to make sense for the situation, um, as well as it needs to be able to stand up to everyday use, and then it needs to be able to be moved around to for any type of classroom uh, environment. Moving on to the creative agenda. To make things easier, this creative agenda breaks down its designs into four main age groups, kindergarten through second grade, third through fifth grade, sixth through eighth grade, and ninth through 12th grade. This is because of the similarities in age groups and academic strategies during these grades. Um, there are four prototypical class designs. They're meant to sit seat 20 to 30 students and provide ample storage, flexibility, as well as durability. This is a quick floor plan of the of a possible kindergarten through second grade uh, situation. The educational focus in kindergarten and through second grade is mainly on play and basic skills, such as sharing or drawing colors, as well as learning to speak and, uh, and uh, saying your alphabet. Moving forward, this is a carpet layout or flooring layout for the classroom itself. Uh, the benefits of having carpet is it's a soft surface for sitting and playing since the main focus is play in the classroom. And then the benefits of having a vinyl tile within the classroom is that the durable surface that can be easily cleaned. Uh, this is helpful, especially in the teaching area where children will make arts and crafts. So if there are any spills, it can be easily cleaned. The furniture used throughout all the designs mainly comes from the Smith system, which is a classroom furniture company used by Vargas Associates and commonly used within the Rochester City School District, as well as other schools in Rochester. Uh, the benefits of the main benefits of these furniture aspects are that it's mobile and durable and offers different options for um, different options for storage as different options for storage. This is a quick rendering of the learning area in the K through second classroom. Uh, as you can see, you can look at the group tables for children as well as the learning area. And then a quick focus is on the marker wall. Uh, it gives a place for children to safely draw on the wall uh, because they like to draw on everything. And so now they have their own safe zone, which is kind of nice to have within the classroom. Moving forward, this is a view of the reading and individual learning area, a place for students to sit and listen to the teacher and possibly read or sit in the soft seating area. A uh, quick focus for this one is the LED lighting, uh, which is used throughout all the designs, so mainly because of the benefits of helping students focus and uh, learn better in the classroom. Moving on to third through fifth grade, the educational focus uh, changes to more academic material, but there's still a little bit of play involved within the classroom. Uh, now students also aren't confined to one room like they are in kindergarten. Uh, they're all, sometimes they'll be moving room to room or it's, or, or yeah, sometimes they'll be moving room to room. This is another carpeting or flooring breakdown. Um, in this area, carpeting is used for the main, the main classroom and then uh, vinyl tile for the starting as students enter the room, especially in wintertime within Rochester, which becomes uh, kids have wet boots all the time. Furniture for the focus is on this one is different types of flow form and soft seating, which are used throughout all the designs itself. 
uh, customer again, it's another customizable storage system. And then uh, the other highlight is the interchange crescent table, which it's a lower table for a teacher to focus on groups with uh, two to three students or maybe multiple in a reading area. Uh, this is a view of the back of the back of the classroom, where you can see the teacher individual group area as well as uh, the soft seating area for students to read during a flex time or something like that. Uh, another focus is on sound absorbing acoustic ceiling tiles to reduce background noise level from classroom to classroom, as well as sound absorbing wall panels that uh, also double act as um, an area for a teacher to pin up classwork as well as different uh, words of encouragement. Moving on to sixth through eighth grade, the educational focus has moved completely to academic material and it's working on preparing students for classroom, uh, for, for high school. This classroom sets up more of a group layout uh, and more of a group layout and allows teachers to come in and focus on uh, one student at a time or one group of students at a time. Uh, the quick furniture breakdown is the interchange diamond desk, which is a mobile desk and it can be rearranged into groups and it's also durable to withstand everyday use. And then another focus is on uh, a wobble stool, which allows students to move in place. This is uh, beneficial for students with learning disabilities or ADD because it allows them to expend energy while staying in one spot the entire time. This is a view of the back of the classroom. You can get a better sense of the grouping of the desks themselves. Uh, there's a gap which allows the teacher to come in and talk with students one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, this is the view of the front of the classroom. You can also see the acoustic panels that are on the wall and allows just an area for professors to put up student work as well as announcements uh, among other things. Finally, ninth through 12th grade, uh, the educational focus has shifted completely to more intensive academic material and preparing students for college. The, the main furniture that I'd like to point out is the planner studio event bench, which is a higher seating for uh, students to sit in the back of a classroom because in the back of class, students could have trouble seeing the front or just seeing the board itself and uh, when teachers are presenting. So this is a quick view of the planner studio bench is higher seating and can be moved around to fit as groups as well. Finally, the conclusion. The physical classroom environment affects student performance. Uh, and this can be whether it's through acoustics, lighting, and furniture selection, because what matters are uh, providing the best situation for students to learn. So whether the background noise level is too high, or uh, the lighting situation is it's not it's not beneficial for students, or mainly uh, when furniture isn't flexible and durable, so it eventually just breaks over time or can't be used can't be utilized uh, in the correct way. And then providing a variety of furniture options, such as different seating, can be beneficial to students because it gives them a, a choice in how they're going to learn in their everyday. Uh, Thank you for your time. I would like to open up the floor to the uh, to Josh for the cross examination. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, it was a very nice presentation. Uh, very thorough. Thank uh, you. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Do you mind um, moving back on your slides so we can just kind of look at them as we, as we talk? Yeah, maybe uh, like the fifth grade classroom back in that range. Okay, yeah, that's a nice that one. Yeah, All sure. Right. Um, so I think you, you picked a really interesting topic uh, and you said your background is in economics? Yes. You're right, okay. So yeah, I appreciated that you kind of uh, tied in uh, that, uh, you know, background in, into your approach to the project. I think that's a really smart thing to do. And I think as a designer, as much as you can invest your kind of expertise and interests into your project, it's always a really good launching point. So that's a, a really great way to kind of engage a project. And I think, you know, obviously project is, uh, extremely timely, uh, insofar as, 
um, because of COVID in the pandemic, um, you know, the in income inequities and the uh, differences in kind of educational opportunities uh, in this country uh, have become incredibly um, uh, even more so apparent uh, given the pandemic, uh, just by virtue of the fact that all of the inequities have been uh, further exacerbated by the fact that suddenly students who have uh, homes that, uh, you know, present challenges, they're now having to, you know, are, are being educated in those environments. So inequities and so forth, as far as the lack of access to uh, the internet, um, even just square meals are all things that uh, schools had um, traditionally uh, helped mitigate. And now uh, that, that doesn't exist. So I think it's, it's really important thing to acknowledge uh, the kind of grave uh, disparity between, um, you know, the sets of learning environments that people um, are in right now, but then also the, you know, what the, the schools have to contend with. And I say this, uh, my wife uh, happens to be a high school principal uh, at a New York City inner uh, city school. So she's very aware of uh, those differences and the, the challenges um, that even just like having a meal, uh, uh, a square meal a day, uh, the school's uh, Unfortunately, uh, for a lot of kids, are where they get the main, uh, main their main sustenance for for the day. So, um, you, you're kind of in a, you you your project takes on a really uh, weighty and kind of there's a lot of responsibility. And you know, uh, being totally direct, it's one where design um, alone can't solve all the problems, right? Uh, so, right. uh, you've taken on a, a kind of a Herculean task and luckily I'm not going to hold you to fixing the problem because no one in this room, including myself could do that with one design. Right. Um, so, uh, but I do think that there are, are ways that design can certainly intervene and improve on the situation. Um, and I, I think that, you know, you've tapped into a lot of, um, really interesting things, uh, that, do go a long way in, in making a difference. Um, and, you know, I, uh, when I was a design director at Toshiba Mori's uh, office, we did an interesting project uh, up near you guys, it was relatively near you, in Syracuse, um, the Syracuse COE and uh, Center for Excellence. And uh, the, one of the main missions of the Syracuse uh, branch of the COE was to research, they do a lot of research in environments and in environmental quality. And one of the big things that uh, they're, they were testing uh, in that facility was the relationship to uh, performance uh, and human comfort. So in other words, uh, you know, as, they, um, as you exist in a building and you're, you know, the kind of the full sensory experiences that you have, how is that conducive to a kind of a learning environment, right? So that the, <clears throat> you know, the subjects who, came into there and for testing, they tested everything from daylight to color, to air quality, to, you know, temperature differentials. Um, and it's, re it's really interesting body of research, uh, interesting center, Ed Bogish was the director at the time and he's, um, he teaches at Syracuse now uh, and uh, he's uh, written a number of really interesting articles on the subject. It'd be somebody that you might wanna look into. Um, and just in, in uh, my neck of the woods uh, in New York City, um, there have been all kinds of studies as it relates to things like environmental noise and the impact uh, that it has on uh, children's ability to um, you know, absorb information. Um, there's a really interesting, the studio I teach, we do a project in Washington Heights, which is the northern part of Manhattan. There's a really interesting um, really interesting study uh, on a school that actually they did a, a range of testing in the school immediately is adjacent to the subway. And they, through testing, figured out the students uh, who were in classrooms that were closer to the subway and the environmental noise of the subway were significantly behind in kind of testing scores as opposed to students who were in classrooms on the other side of the, the school. So it's, it's really, there's a really wide range. Like I feel like you, you've you uh, delved into a subject that you could really, you know, you could turn this into a master's thesis if you wanted to. Um, so it's a really, really interesting subject. Um, and another thing that, you know, I think that we talked about in the, the um, you know, politics today, one of the things that uh, everybody seems to agree on is that uh, infrastructure in this country is, our aging infrastructure is a real um, 
liability for this country. And one of those things I think is a, a, a aging infrastructure that people don't, you know, we're always focusing on the infrastructure of the highways and the train systems and so forth and bridges, which are all obviously in desperate need of um, intervention, but school schools, um, a lot of the stock of our schools was uh, developed uh, at, at a point that it's kind of aging out. And I think that uh, the school authorities throughout the country are really having to contend with these things. So I, I really commend uh, where you're kind of investing your, your project. And I love the fact that it's, you know, in uh, primary and schools and so forth that I think is a really great way to engage the, the project. Um, so I, I did think in, in your kind of design studies, um, I like the fact that you kind of take a case study through a, a classroom. I think that's actually a really great way to kind of test ideas, right? I think it's pretty interesting, like in the case of this one. And you, you, you kind of took the box and you deconstructed it with a variety of kind of different types of interventions, right? And, and I thought that was pretty interesting. You from furniture systems to colors to wall surfaces uh, and to lighting. And I think that's a, that's a really good way to kind of test um, ideas, a kind of iterative test uh, process, which I think is great. And I, I really like that you did that. And I liked that you did it through the multiple age groups. Uh, and there seemed to be some, you know, pretty good reasoning um, with each of the, the tests. Uh, I, I did think, you know, um, when you're thinking about things like color in walls, you, you kind of picked a, a color scheme, right? The kind of blue, green, uh, and, you know, uh, I'm really into the kind of uh, uh, color wheel and thinking about like color um, relationships. There's a, uh, an artist named uh, Joseph and Joseph and Andy Albers. They were a couple and they did a lot of uh, studies on color theory and relationship with color. I don't know if that's something you've studied, but it might be, yeah, go ahead, sorry. I've studied a little bit. I've heard a little bit about the Albus. That was fun. I, I like some of the work. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, great. Sorry. Uh, so, yeah. So, I think it would be something to uh, consider or think about. I mean, I think the deceptive logic of color and how it actually changes the, the space, I think I see some of that in your work. And I, I think it's interesting. So, I, I, I would uh, encourage you to, you know, even try different, uh, in other words, to create zones. Because one of the things I think in the furniture systems, the furniture systems I thought that they were more interesting were the ones that were breaking down the space and creating kind of basically deconstructing the cube in ways that was creating kind of uh, individual learning environments um, within the space. Um, so I don't know, do you wanna talk about that a little bit uh, insofar as your design? Uh, mainly with the idea of uh, would you would you mean like color or actual like the individual learning? kind of the the whole thing I mean as far as creating different atmospheres within the the room so the goal was looking at the actual classrooms at a like a prototypical level because all classrooms have different types of purposes so like a science room or maybe just an uh, uh, a music room or something like that they all have different uh, needs but the whole goal of this project was to create prototypical rooms with design aspects that can be applied kind of universally throughout a school and then taking out a looking at all the different age groups like with uh, kindergarten through second grade mainly on looking at their focuses of like academic thing, ideas and like breaking down the room so within kindergarten uh, children play a lot so they need room to move around and play and they're all in one space so it's a larger classroom and then moving on to uh, uh, third through fifth grade or third yeah moving on to third through fifth grade uh, it changes more to actual academics and then you're starting to learn more uh, increase uh, math and but uh, math, uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, as you grow the fo the educational focus changes as I mentioned in the presentation earlier and then finally picking and deciding on how to break down the classroom itself was uh, into, in normal classrooms currently, especially within middle school and high school, it's the basic table glued to a chair in a lecture format that's all the way and everybody can hear any, any of those tables moving around anywhere in the school. And those were, I'm pretty sure those desks were designed uh, forever ago and they haven't really been updated since in most schools. And, and I don't think they're actually ergonomically comfortable or helpful to students at all. So the idea of this was, uh, to create furniture that was mobile. And so you could have your typical layout, but set up group furniture as well. And then break down the idea of setting up a soft furniture area in each room because 
uh, during the classroom school day, not all schools have a class straight up from one period to the end of the day. Usually there'll be a free period and so, or, uh, and students will need a place to be. And so the idea of the soft seating was students can come in, read a book or just sit around, uh, wait for the next class and see what's next. And so that was the idea of trying to include soft seating as well as typical desks within the classroom itself. No, I think that's great. I mean, I think that the idea of that, uh, thinking of each of the zones and creating, like you said, the soft uh, seating is really important, just insofar as what I was talking about before, and so in, in that a lot of the students, especially from um, ec economically challenged backgrounds, like they come to school and they get like their breakfast, right, at school. Uh, the schools actually provide them multiple meals. So having a space that they could actually, you know, have the meal, uh, maybe within the classroom. I think a lot of one of the big things to think about in that respect is, um, you know, shame is a really, uh, you know, because the kids who are receiving uh, school assisted lunch, you know, and then being placed in the classroom is it's a it's a really um, challenging and kind of uh, it's a tough uh, design challenge. And I think that pr providing a space that feels like a space that they can, you know, almost somewhere between a living room and a classroom that it, it feels like a space that's inviting is, is a really great thing. And I also think that the, the idea of creating the furnishing systems that are much more dynamic is definitely essential. I mean, most classroom is moving away from the kind of, uh, you know, uh, master lecturer single point perspective and much more into group discussion, small group work and so forth. So I think that your, your attention to furniture systems in that way is really great um, in the way that they're recombinant and kind of, uh, you know, I would have uh, liked to see like all different kinds of kind of configurations, right? Like where could you really take this and how could the soft systems interact with the, um, the you know, harder systems and, you know, what are all the different um, configurations you could come uh, up with. Um, one of the things I think that, you know, in looking at your project, I'd really encourage you to, to uh, look at is kind of looking at those different zones that you're creating and using some of the other uh, conventions that we have, uh, you know, as designers in order to study them. And um, I don't know how uh, much you were encouraged to create cross sections, but I think cross sections of the spaces, like the zones, like the soft seating and thinking about ergonomics and actually like how the body engages each of those spaces is a really important way to kind of develop a, a design idea and really think about placemaking within an environment, right? So it's like, I think, you know, you did the overall rendering and you're looking at this as a totality, right? But then to the zoom in to each one of them and really tell us what the uh, character of each of those spaces, I think that's a way to kind of really develop the design. Um, I also think, um, you know, uh, it's kind of uh, funny in architecture school, everybody, you know, we're, totally obsessed with space, right? So, but if you sent this picture that's on the screen to like, uh, you know, your grandparents, wherever they live, they'd be like, well, where are all the people? Uh, and I, I think it's, it's a, you know, all of our, all of our representations look like they're the day after, uh, you know, uh, a nuclear holocaust, like everybody's gone. Um, so really thinking about people and how the people engage them, I, I would say, especially if you're getting into kind of a portfolio situation, you want to like, you know, that's a really important part. You know, you've got a really dynamic backstory of what you're trying to accomplish. And I think that your rep some of your representations, not all of them, but some of them might want to start to like delve into how they actually engage, um, you know, humans. Um, and uh, uh, so I think that, that I would uh, do that. And then the last thing I, I would say, when you worked on the, the uh, project, um, I really liked how you used the curve to kind of inscribe um, kind of what I call kind of breaking down the cube um, as a device. And I think that the, what I liked about it is you were taking the ground plane and you were saying with the ground plane, okay, you know, this is something that can maneuver between spaces and I can shift, you know, it can do one thing and then the other. It can define a space at one moment and then just be kind of a color uh, at, the, at the next. And I, I would encourage you to like think about the duality of in the way that you used color in all of the things that you're creating. Like for lighting, you talked about LED lighting, right? But then you gave us a kind of like very traditional grid of lights, right? The kind of default lighting. I wonder if there's a way that somehow the lighting and the color or the lighting and the daylighting might work together 
to also create that kind of uh, more dimensionality to the space and create the different zones, right? Um, right. I agree. Uh, originally, when I was thinking of the lighting and the lighting system, uh, traditionally, uh, I was thinking of trying to come up with more of a feasible situation. Uh, I didn't go into budgets in this presentation, but I was thinking more feasible. And I felt like uh, that typical grid, I'm assuming that most schools already have one. So it would be a kind of a replacement update idea of it. But you're right. I think that the next idea would be to move into furthering, uh, breaking up the zones and focusing on things and then uh, playing with light itself to create all these aspects. But uh, my original thinking behind pretty much everything with the design was either to use things that are commonly used in the district already, as well as uh, to try to come up with a feasible design for uh, these low income schools, because that's, I think, a big factor that's going to come into it all. Oh, absolutely. It has to be hyper pragmatic, right? Because you're right. talking about distribution to, and I, I totally buy that uh, rationale, like uh, I'm a pragmatist at heart. But they, again, I love those kind of pragmatic challenges, right? Like you, so that's the, that's where uh, as a designer, you can really like make a difference, right? Like you can say, okay, I know I'm going to have a four by two grid. There's no way that I can avoid that four by two grid, right? But how can I work within the limitations of that system and create something that's just going to push it just to that little bit of difference that makes a difference, right? And so that's what I would encourage you to do. Maybe it's a rearranging the light grid. Maybe it's about introducing even just a colored panel in certain areas. And maybe that circle that you have uh, inscribed on the ground plane maybe gets projected onto the ceiling somehow by using different panels. I mean, it's there, there, are, I, there are still ways even within the normative to create the kind of uh, extraordinary. So I, I would encourage you to you know, keep pushing. But I, I do appreciate the fact that you were attentive to the um, necessity of the project and, and the kind of urgency of the project, right? I mean, it's not, uh, it's, you know, uh, coming up with a very idealistic, completely um, unrealistic, uh, you know, design is not going to move the needle anywhere, right? That's just, that's, so, um, good. Uh, let's see. I don't know, how am I doing on time? Here. Um, our briefing session ends at 3.50. So we have a couple more minutes for your uh, comments and then we can open up to Robin and Richard. I see Richard's on with us. Okay. Um, well, Johnson, uh, what do you, what do you uh, I always like to pose this back to my students. What do you think if you were going to advance this project to the next level, what would you, what would you focus on? Uh, I, I guess I'd focus on, um, actually I'd focus on how to, how to work within a budget itself and actually economic feasibility, as I, I said earlier, uh, I think that is the realistic idea of how to implement all of this and then understanding that this won't be enough to fix it all. But in the end, following that would be to, uh, either try to set up an actual academic support system within a school to encourage them. Uh, that's what happened with uh, the University of Rochester at East High, and I think that format is going to work well across the board in all situations. Uh, what they did was they tried to make it a welcoming place where teachers know kids all the time. Uh, yet that way you have people that know you, people who are friends with you in school itself. So, and then the goal of this was to create, I know, a a a really beneficial design that will move forward and help help with people. So I guess the next step would be to how to make this feasible, necessarily how to make it feasible, but uh, the typical feasibility of it all, and then pushing the forward design of how do we make it not look like, uh, how do we make it look like a really fun place to be in and not just the typical boring classroom. Mm -hmm. and that's that's the next step. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one, one last uh, thing, uh, kind of thinking about it. Uh, one thing that does seem to be largely absent from your um, designs, which is kind of interesting, and I guess maybe you could speak to it, but you don't seem to actually have much in the way of technology, uh, it, it, which is a really kind of critical part of uh, most classrooms these days. Correct. Uh, originally, uh, so typically with this, we have the typical uh, uh, was it, uh, projectors, but at the same time, uh, most schools within the school district uh, varies with on what existing technology they already have. So there's a lot of schools within the Rochester, 
Rochester City School District that already have smart boards or have all gone one to one with uh, iPads or Microsoft tablets or Chromebooks. And so like all the students have all of that already. Uh, but this was mainly focusing uh, technology is another big aspect that would also I'd like to bring into. Okay, great. Good. So I guess at that point, Mary, I should maybe turn it back over to the rest of the group. Sure. Um, Rich, Richard and uh, Robin, we can open the floor up to you folks. You each have five minutes. Um, let, me, let me go first, uh, if that's okay. Um, uh, Josh, I, I was listening to a lot of your points, and, and, I, and as I was listening to them, I was thinking about the last three or four months working with Jonathan on this. And this was one of those projects that the more you learned, the more you knew you needed to find out. Uh, the more you don't know, the more you find out that you don't know on top of that. Uh, this, this really became a domino principle. And, and I'm very proud of the way that John was able to get his arms around this. This, this actually started out as an exercise in design and economics became so prevalent in the whole thing relative to understanding and, and trying to solve the problem that it was it was co-driven by economics and then other factors also what kind of wound into the whole exercise. Um, and, and I think at some point Jonathan was was in a position where he had to say, okay, we've got to get our arms around this as best we can. We can't solve all of the problems. Um, and I'm going to pick and choose my problems that we can attend to based upon a number of specific categories. And, and I think the presentation you did, I think, was, was, was well put together. Uh, um, there are a ton of other areas that you could have extended a lot of effort in. We know that. Um, there's time constraints and everything. Um, but you also have discovered that, that the, 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 the solutions that you've come up with, the ideas that you've come up with, the imagery that you come up with all have the potential to work. Um, could you do more? Absolutely. If you had more money, you could. If the budgets are better, everything could be better. Um, but I think that the reality of the fact is that as equally as driven as this is in design, I think it's equally driven by economics in, within the school districts and, and the municipalities that are involved with this. Um, economics is always going to drive this. And I think that was one of the things that, that we all discovered when we talked about this originally with you, is that you know how much of the focus of this is non-design. And, and until design really has no, no bearing on what you can do, because it becomes a utopian solution at that time. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, from, you know, from, from my experience with what you did and the path that you took on this, I, I'm, I'm very pleased with the efforts that you made. I think the outcome that you put forth was a good one. Um, uh, I think there's a few other areas that could be touched upon, and I think Josh brought them up. Uh, I agree uh, with, with, with some of the color issues and some of the technology issues and, and some of the things that could be expanded upon. I also, and, I, and also I wasn't thinking about it until Josh brought it up, but I think it might be more successful to add people and add bodies into this and add, and add uh, so that you can actually see and feel how the space is being used with people and with, with children uh, and with teachers and staff. Um, so I think that's all very good. I think I think the only thing that I would pose to you is, you know, um, you know, knowing what you know now, knowing all the hard work you put into this, knowing all the research that you did, you know, what's the strongest thing that you can take from this presentation? What did you learn in this situation that you can take away from it? Because you worked hard on this. Uh, what did I like? What did I learn? I learned uh, that there's no one end all be all solution for this entire thing, and it's very complicated to solve this. And uh, it's really in order to do this project ju proper justice, I'd say it. Yeah, I'd need to go. I would need to delve into something further, uh, especially with like adding population with design working on ideas of how people interact with everything itself, like you had mentioned. And then moreover with uh, just trying to understand the entire design as a whole from every aspect. And then going into further with this, I, I feel like I focused mainly on the furniture, lighting and acoustics. Uh, I could have gone more into 
um, thermal aspects of the design or possible just understanding the whole school layout as a whole and moving forward into what's what are better uh, other design solutions and i think moving forward i think that would be a nice place to take this project i agree i, I think i agree with that you know and and do you think you left anything out that is completely pivotal in trying to find a solution if that is what what, what was the one thing you left out or you left out the one thing i left out was the budget uh the actual budget down understanding of it i feel like that's it's a major factor that could probably come into it all uh understanding like a basic school district budget I, I feel like it's public somewhere like what's their number yearly mm -hmm. and then trying to break down how they could uh bring this in i think that's also the next big step of the feasibility of this actual project that would make it more real that's another five years worth of work done yes yes <laughs> yes no that's, that's that's all i get to say and you know i think you did a great job and, and I think, as, as we had talked about, I think you were able to pull this all together and tie a nice ribbon around it. And, and uh, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end here. And I think you've done a good job. Thank you. Robin? All right, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so just starting out, John, I forgot how powerful the, the, the beginning of your presentation is, the bullet points with all the statistics that really hits home. I think that comes across very well. Um, I don't know if everyone else thought that, but it really kind of, like, like Josh said, illustrates the need for the research that you're doing and you know the, the why behind your presentation. So I thought that was great. Um, jumping back to, to Rich's budget question, just briefly, I know you went into a little bit in depth into East High. Um, did, so U of R, University of Rochester, being a private entity, um, did they, in any of that research, did they provide funding? Did they provide additional dollars uh, they did provide additional dollars because uh, they brought in people from their own program uh, from the school itself to actually come in and uh, turn everything around. It's not like Rochester City School District mm -hmm. gave them more money or the school found money out of it or New York State gave them more money. It was from U of R. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That, then that, see, that makes sense. And that's how they had the initial budget. Um, and kind of what you're going to, you're going to move forward into academic feasibility. But um, did you, in any of your research, did you find are that any schools are, are applying for grants or are they getting any kind of additional funding because sometimes the, the pot of money you have is the pot of money you have but um have has anything did you come across any of that so uh there was one number uh that i was looking at for like the rochester city school district as a whole because that's the district with the highest poverty rate uh and within it and i was looking at what they get for state funding and it was about $200 million spread across 65 schools. So uh, $200 million is a lot of money, but when you spread it across 65 schools, in the end, it goes towards paying teacher salaries, paying the electric bill, paying heating and cooling. And it's basically just, can I get to another year? And so that was typical for, they've been getting about that much since, uh, uh, since 2018. Yeah, okay, good. Um, yeah, I, I think I agree with, with Rich and Josh. Um, you guys have really kind of run in depth so far. You've come a long way on the stuff that we've talked about and the advancements. Um, and you already just went over the things that you would do differently and, and stuff. Is there anything that surprised you about this, the, the conclusion of your thesis? What, what surprised you at the end of it? Uh, no, no, nothing really. In the end, I felt like this was where to go. And uh, I felt like these were the questions that were going to be brought up, especially at the end of the thesis itself. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I guess what I am surprised was that uh, was it, it felt uh, I didn't crack under pressure. I, I felt like I was able to hold my own and be able to talk to everybody about this, and that felt really good. So yeah. Good. Well, it looks great. Congrats. Thank you great very job. much. Great. Thank you, um, Josh. Any last any last comments? We have about one minute left for questioning. Yeah, no, you didn't crack under pressure. You were great. Your presentation was uh, very clear and concise. So congratulations. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, I love the humility. That's great. Um, so yeah, I think uh, echoing what everyone else said, I think it's, it's really interesting. The one thing I will say based on, you know, as you're in school, you do have the, I, I, I really love the pragmatism and I love the fact that you were, you know, you use your economics, but don't, don't be afraid to, to dream, right? Like, 
just because the the school budgets uh, afford a certain amount of money that's i would make the argument that the school budgets maybe need to be increased right like especially given some of the challenges that uh, the schools are facing and obviously i have a principal at home that i'm making this argument uh, for but uh, school budgets uh, and especially those that are dealing with uh, students that uh, come from uh, places of uh, you know income and equity uh, maybe need a, a bit more of a boost. So you push the big vision, uh, and, but uh, definitely keep your feet grounded in pragmatism because you have to be able to do both. Right, I agree. I, schools should schools should probably get a bigger budget in the end of the day. Uh, I think that would make sense. So yeah, but thank you. Yeah, we have we have teachers in our house too, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a discussion over every dinner table now. So uh, we'll, hear it, we'll hear it from all the sides. Well, congratulations, Jonathan, on completing your capstone. I would like to extend a sincere thank you on behalf of RIT's interior design program to Josh and to our committee members, Robin and Richard, for their valuable feedback. We're indebted to all of you for your thoughtful cross-examination of our student work. And I also see that our Dean Todd Jokel has joined the call uh, during the session. So I wanna recognize Todd and thank him for being here with us in support of the students and our work uh, and to, to see our cross-examination. I also wanna thank Lisa for helping out behind the scenes here. And we of course wanna thank our audience for attending and giving Jonathan your attention and support. So the committee and the examining scholar and I will now enter into the breakout room for deliberations. And this completes the final oral defense for Jonathan. So congratulations again. For those of you on the call, you're welcome to stay on for the next pr presentation. And thank you all for attending and have a great afternoon. <laughs>